Hey, look, buddy, I'm an engineer. That means I solve problems. Not problems like, why did that one condo building in Florida fall down because my wife doesn't like me taking out of town assignments. I solve nerd problems. For instance, how am I gonna stop a bunch of digital robot doppelgangers from destroying a virtual hat-making facility? The answer? Overanalyze the shit out of the game mechanics. And if that don't work, find a way to help the newbies play better. Hmm. Like this 30-minute, fully scripted little old video treatise written by me. Edited by me. And you best hope not featuring you in the bloopers. The engineer is the backbone of his team in Man vs. Machine. There's no such thing as a mandatory class for any reasonably balanced mission, but the engineer comes the closest. His dispenser keeps teammates in the fight by healing them and, more importantly, giving them an infinite supply of ammo to fight the endless horde of robots. His teleporters make sure dead players can get back to the front as quickly as possible, instead of wasting 40 seconds just walking across the map. And a well-placed sentry is a commanding presence on the battlefield, denying the robot's advance with its withering firepower, substantial health pull, and immunity to crits and knockback. Its area denial is especially valuable to less vigilant teams that tend to let the bomb carrier slip away unnoticed. MVM missions just go more smoothly with a good engineer because the engineer isn't just another player. He builds the infrastructure that gets his teammates to the fight and keeps them there. The engineer doesn't have a true primary weapon because he fights with his buildings, which he builds with his melee weapon. The main pitfall to avoid with this weapon slot is equipping the Gunslinger. Gunslinger Engineer is a fun but relatively weak subclass in Man vs. Machine, since the mini sentries you construct are just not very well suited to the high DPS environment. Feel free to try it out on occasion, but I'm not going to cover it here. So with that out of the way, let's take a look at the other wrenches. The stock wrench is always a good choice. It builds and repairs buildings, and you can whack robots with it in a pinch. Honestly, it's probably the best choice. The Jag has a faster swing speed, which lets you build more quickly, making it the only wrench unlock that really has a point in MVM, but it's less useful than in PvP due to the difference in game mechanics, and it might not help you at all if you just use canteens anyway. As a downside, the Jag does less damage against both enemies and sappers, so it's not the best for fending off spy bots. It also has a slower repair rate, which cancels out the swing speed buff when it comes to repairing damaged buildings instead of building new ones. Like I said, the stock is probably better overall, but it's not that big of a deal either way. I use the Jag because mine is professional killstreak. The Southern Hospitality is also usually a slight but definite downgrade from the stock wrench. In most situations, the ability to get random crits is more useful than the bleed on hit effect it has instead. And now you're just more vulnerable to fire too, for some reason. Finally, the Eureka effect is probably the worst choice after the Gunslinger. Sneaky teleporter shenanigans don't have much point in MVM, and building new teleporters in the middle of a wave is uncommon. Meanwhile, it makes you slightly slower at building stuff, and it makes it harder to refill your metal supply, which is probably the biggest debuff out of any of the wrenches that can actually build level 3 sentries.
The Wrangler is hands down the engineer's best general purpose secondary weapon. It provides a strong defensive buff for his sentry, boosts range, boosts damage output, and allows him to manually prioritize targets. With the Wrangler, the engineer can stare down a giant heavy robot while his sentry tanks thousands of points of damage, and it's hard to overstate just how valuable that ability is. Not to mention, basically every fancy looking maneuver you can pull off with your sentry requires the Wrangler. Still, the short circuit is also popular, since it has the ability to destroy enemy projectiles with its alternate attack. This can also be a very powerful ability, or even crutch. It's best as a situational weapon though, and I recommend swapping it out for the Wrangler on waves where it's less useful. That is, when there are fewer projectiles. The stock pistol and its reskins are too weak to be of much use in MVM. It's not the end of the world if that's all you have equipped, but an engineer should really be relying on his primary weapon and his wrench as his self-defense sidearms, not his pistol. The gun you choose for your primary weapon depends a lot on your playstyle and on what you plan to use it for. The Rescue Ranger is great for a mobile playstyle because it allows you to both repair and pick up buildings remotely. The downsides are significant though. The Rescue Ranger can be unwieldy for self-defense, and all damage to your character is mini-crit boosted when you're carrying buildings, so you shouldn't equip this weapon unless you're actually taking advantage of its special abilities. The Widowmaker can fire continuously without any reloading and it can replenish your metal quickly by leeching ammo from robots. This means that it's very good as a self-defense sidearm, if your sentry gets destroyed, as a tank busting tool, and as a special utility. However, it uses your metal reserve as its ammo, so it requires careful resource management and will quickly drain your metal if you're not a good shot. Great weapon, but decidedly not for beginners. The Pomsen 6000 has a neat side effect that allows you to drain Uber Charge from enemy medic robots. It's a bit of a niche ability and can be tricky to implement effectively, but some players like to use it for defusing giant medics. Finally, the Frontier Justice, the Panic Attack, and the Stock Shotgun are all basically the same thing. They're all purely self-defense weapons with no special technical abilities. The stock is the standard, the Frontier Justice stores crits but can only fire three times before needing reloaded, and the panic attack is... the panic attack. Just be careful that the Frontier Justice's crit mechanic doesn't tempt you to go full battle NG. Your sentry is way more powerful than your gun, so don't neglect your buildings. Now, for the first time in this series, I'm going to talk about power-up canteens. You never need canteens in Man vs. Machine, and their effect on the balance of the game mode is complicated, but it's important to note that the engineer has access to a special building upgrade canteen. Unlike the popular uber charge and critical hit boost canteens, which just provide a temporary, temporary burst, burst of, of skill, skill, the building upgrade canteen is relatively cheap to purchase and instantly upgrades all your deployed buildings to level 3 with maximum health. This can be invaluable if your team just got overrun and all of your buildings were destroyed, or if you just weren't paying attention for a second and your sentry got blown up. It's completely possible to play the engineer without canteens, but they're a nice little get out of jail free card. Building stuff the old fashioned way and using canteens are usually both valid strategies, although canteens tend to be superior for clutch, last minute saves, and not using them is more sustainable for long, drawn out ones. Since the engineer fights through his buildings, a good upgrade path focuses on upgrading those instead of upgrading his weapons. The first thing that most people will tell you that the engineer needs is dispenser range, and while there are exceptions to everything, I think that's a pretty good rule of thumb. 
Increased dispenser range makes your dispenser much easier to use and even allows teammates to move and fight without leaving the area of effect. Any time that your teammates waste looking for ammo or health packs is time not spent fighting robots, so dispenser range is a great force multiplier. Go ahead and maximize this upgrade right away if possible, although two ticks is probably good enough for wave one if you really need the money for something else. After dispenser range, the engineer's upgrade path is a lot more situational than those of most other classes. He's not just trying to optimize firepower and increase survivability. He also has to worry about things like teammate support, deployment speed, and sentry buster evasion. So I think there's a bit more room for using judgment than there is for a purely combat-oriented class. Usually, the next thing I buy is one tick of 50% max metal capacity. This is huge because it allows you to place both a sentry and a dispenser without replenishing your metal first. Next, I usually get one tick of plus 100% building health because it literally doubles the amount of damage your sentry can take and your other buildings too, but that's less important. Next, I'll probably get one tick of increased sentry firing speed. After that, honestly, I don't have any particular order I go by. I'll get more building health if I think I need better defense. I'll get more metal capacity if I think I'll be burning through a lot of metal, and I might even get a bit of increased attack speed for my wrench if I think I'll need to rebuild my stuff a lot, since I don't usually use canteens. Why not more sentry firing speed? Oh, uh, one minor note here, the plus 10% firing speed upgrade is and always has been severely glitched. By my estimate, the first tick actually boosts firing speed by about 67% for an unwrangled sentry, and it roughly doubles the firing speed of a wrangled sentry, on top of the 67% boost provided by the wrangler itself. This allows you to expend all of your bullets in only 9 seconds. The second and third ticks, however, do nothing and should not be purchased unless the first tick doesn't work. Resistances aren't as high of a priority for the Engineer as for most other classes, since his buildings do most of the fighting for him. But he isn't a bulky class either, so early or mid-game crit resistance can still be a good idea to protect him against cheap deaths, especially if you're using the Rescue Ranger. And the other resistances do help once you've got some money to spare. Increased movement speed, too, can be helpful once you've got some building upgrades. The Engineer class is all about positioning, and increased movement speed can help you deploy and move your stuff around the map a lot faster. Gun upgrades are usually not a priority, but it's not uncommon to find yourself in a situation where it makes sense to start buying them after your sentry is at full power. Projectile penetration, health on kill, increased reload speed, and increased firing speed can all be helpful depending on what you're using your gun for. Three upgrades which I generally wouldn't recommend at all are two-way teleporters, metal regen, and the disposable mini sentry. Experienced players often get the two-way teleporter upgrade as a convenience to minimize downtime between waves on maps with no forward upgrade station but the upgrade doesn't actually have much tactical value as far as fighting robots goes. A suicide bind or teleport to spawn canteen charge is usually a cheaper and more effective way of getting back to spawn in an emergency. And inexperienced engineers sometimes place teleporter exits where their teammates might accidentally step on them and get sucked back to spawn against their will. Metal regen doesn't hurt, but it's just so slow that the effect is hard to notice in a fast-paced game of MVM, so it's usually very low priority. Finally, the disposable mini sentry. Newbies flock to this upgrade like moths to a flame, but it is so bad. To be clear, the disposable mini sentry is actually weaker than the normal mini sentries you build with the gunslinger, and at 500 credits, that tiny bit of extra firepower is one of the most expensive upgrades in the game. 
Even when I have tons of extra money to buy it, I usually don't because I don't want the extra clutter in my HUD. This is a late game upgrade at best. Good building placement is the first step to being an effective engineer. Now, the purpose of this video is not to teach you a bunch of neat little tips and tricks about where to put your buildings on every map. A lot of those tricks rely on flaws in the map design to work, and while I personally think that exploits are mostly harmless fun compared to actual cheating, the goal of this video is to help you actually become good at the game. So, this video needs to be as applicable to a community map that hasn't even been put on the workshop yet as it is to the six official maps that so many people know by heart. Besides, in addition to the map itself, building placement is also affected by which classes your teammates are playing, your teammate's skill level, the weapons you have equipped, and the specific composition and direction of the robot wave. Instead of memorizing a list of spots to put your buildings, we're going to take a look at some of the general rules of thumb about what makes for good positioning. The first building you'll want to place down is your teleporter entrance. Your entrance should be easily visible from all spawn doors and should be either equally distant from the doors or closest to the one that players are likely to come out of. Teleport, the entrance should also be in a place where players aren't likely to step on it by accident while defending the hatch and it's a plus if it's behind cover too. Next is the exit. It's possible to place very aggressive forward exits when playing with experienced teammates, but for general gameplay I recommend choosing a location that's closer to the center of the map and will continue to be useful in case you get pushed back a bit. It's best to pick a location that's behind cover, or at least out of sight of robots advancing along the bomb path but not too far out of the way that your teammates will still have a long walk after taking the teleporter. Also, don't forget to right click so that it doesn't face the wall. Your dispenser should be placed where it's convenient for your team, especially any heavies you might have since they're slow and less able to reach ammo packs than other classes are. Typically, this means your dispenser should be placed on the ground adjacent to the main route that the robots are taking to the hatch. Robots don't prioritize dispensers very highly as a target, but it should still be behind cover because injured teammates will be huddled next to it. How close the dispenser should be to the robot spawn depends on how good your team is and how aggressive of a position you think they can hold. Do not be one of those engineers that turtles and keeps their dispenser all to themselves. When it comes to sentry placement, resist your dumb monkey instincts to put your sentry in a safe spot up high. Usually, the best place for a sentry is right along the bomb path up against cover that you can hide behind while repairing it. You can find the bomb path before the wave starts by looking for the glowing blue arrows telling robots which way to go. An inside corner at a turn in the path is a good spot because then your sentry can physically obstruct the robots, especially giant scouts, and literally block the bomb from advancing. Another class on your team, like the Heavy, might prefer to take this blocking role though, in which case it's best to give him some space so you don't accidentally blow him up with a sentry buster. But more on that later. Heavies are better at blocking than sentries if there are a lot of sentry busters, but sentries are better if robots are using some sort of knockback mechanic. So, if you're on a giant scout wave where blocking is crucial, you'll need to work out with your teammates who's going to do this job. Make sure there's a convenient ammo pack near your sentry for you to replenish your metal. After all, your dispenser should be with your teammates, and depending on the map, it might be too far away to be a reliable source of metal for you. Finally, if your team's relying on one or more specific players to drop uber medic bots before they pop their charges, then you need to either be diligent with the Wrangler to avoid triggering them, or place your sentry far enough away that it doesn't shoot them as they spawn. Not too far back though. Don't be tempted to place your sentry in a very passive location, or even worse, back at spawn. Just in case we get pushed back! 
If your team can't hold the front, then you need to make the robots pay for every inch of ground they take. Waiting until you've almost lost to actually start using your full power is counterproductive, to say the least. If possible, find a sentry spot that's far enough back to clean up robots that make it past your team, but still far enough forward that it can shoot into the frontline killing zone either automatically or with the Wrangler. Your buildings won't always stay in one place though. You may have to change positions several times during a wave, especially if you get pushed back. To that end, MVM has some special mechanics with regard to the engineer's buildings. Once a building is constructed, it can be picked up, carried, and redeployed instantly. In addition to being a great way to get around the Wrangler's cooldown effect, this means the engineer can play much more dynamically than in regular TF2, moving his sentry and other buildings around at will without needing to wait for a rebuild animation to finish. This is good, because playing the engineer in Man vs. Machine is all about positioning, but even with his relatively enhanced mobility in the game mode, the engineer is still not a very agile class. Usually, you have to either hold a front, or when that's not possible, fall back to a more defensible position. You should never allow the bomb to get past your sentry as an engineer, which is why it's a bad idea to turtle in a high place or off to the side of the bomb path. Placing your sentry in the way of the bomb forces the robots to destroy it before advancing. And if the robots kill you, at least you get sent back to spawn to defend there. An engineer stuck behind enemy lines is basically worthless to his teammates, no matter how many of the infinitely spawning support bots he kills. Blocking is an essential tactic for playing the engineer. Sentries aren't always easy to move around, so forcing the robots to stay where you are helps to overcome one of the engineer's main weaknesses. Sentries have a lot of health, are immune to crits, and can't be pushed out of the way by any attack, making them a nice artificial wall for you to put in front of the robots. Especially when it comes to giant robots, stopping them in their tracks is almost as good as killing them faster, and blocking is the best way to do it. Robots aren't really smart enough to walk around an obstacle, so they'll simply bump into it until they're destroyed or their failsafe programming tells them to try jumping over the obstruction. Using your sentry to block can buy your team a lot of time while dealing a lot of damage, especially when using the Wrangler. The Wrangler increases the survivability of your sentry while letting you stand far back enough to not get hit by splash damage from rockets and grenades, as might happen if you're standing next to it repairing it. If a robot does manage to jump over your sentry and you can't pick the gun up again, you can sometimes step in and block the robot again with your body while the robot continues to look and shoot backwards. If you do this, use the Wrangler to stop your sentry from shooting rockets so that you don't die from self-inflicted splash damage. You may have heard me mention sentry busters several times already without discussing them at all. Sentry Busters are large, reskinned demo men that try to destroy sentries. The engineer would be overpowered at lower difficulties without them because he could just set up a sentry and idle with his wrench swinging to win the game. Unless other team members cooperate to destroy them early, Sentry Busters force engineers to actually play the game. Sentry Busters spawn based on how much damage a sentry has done during a wave. They'll chase a sentry until they either touch it or are destroyed. When a sentry buster reaches a sentry, or the engineer holding it, it will crouch and explode. Sentry busters are fast, can clip through players, and their explosions are almost impossible to survive. The traditional way of dealing with them is to pick up your sentry, use it to lure the buster to a safe spot where it won't hurt anyone, and then run away during its crouch animation. This should be done as quickly as possible to minimize your sentry's downtime, and I can't emphasize this enough, a safe distance away from your teammates. Sometimes you'll just have to let a buster destroy your sentry, in which case you should get yourself clear and warn your teammates to stay away too. Tanks present an interesting problem for the engineer. NG is rather good at destroying tanks, especially early games since sentries can achieve maximum DPS with a single upgrade. However, unlike robots, tanks cannot be blocked. They will crush any sentry in their way so the engineer can't just force them to stay in range. 
Focus fire with the Wrangler is the most efficient way to destroy a tank in the short term, but high health tanks will make it past your sentry, which complicates things. You could ignore the tank once it gets past you, allowing a more mobile but potentially less effective teammate to finish it off. You could move your sentry along with the tank, which is usually quite effective, but you do lose efficiency when your sentry isn't shooting. And keeping a sentry that's firing non-stop supplied with metal can be difficult while on the move. Alternatively, you may opt to leave your sentry unattended for a moment while you follow the tank and chip away at it with your wrench or other sidearm, like the Widowmaker, hopefully with the help of a teammate. Sometimes it will be better to just focus on keeping your dispenser within range of the tank, which ensures that your teammates who are busting the tank never have to waste time getting ammo. All of these are valid approaches, and it's up to you to pick the most suitable one for the situation. Finally, don't forget the engineer's mortal enemy, the Spybot. Spybots usually spawn behind your team and seem to prioritize engineer buildings. They're not particularly strong or smart on their own, but they are fast. If you're not paying attention, or if they attack in a group and manage to start placing sappers on your sentry, they can be a significant threat. Try baiting them into attacking while your sentry is active, so they lose their disguises and the sentry shoots them. If that's not possible, getting close and using your wrench is safer than in PvP because they don't trick stab. But multiple non-backstab hits will wear your health down quickly, so I recommend using your gun if there are more than one. If you're really overwhelmed, don't be afraid to call a teammate for help. But please, don't expect the pyro to just babysit you for an entire wave. The Engineer can be a powerful combatant, especially early in the game, but as other classes accumulate weapon upgrades, it gets harder for him to stand out, or sometimes even keep up, after reaching his DPS cap. As a result, team expectations for the Engineer tend to focus on how he's supporting the team. And boy are their expectations. The Engineer's buildings are easily visible evidence of his internal thought process, leaving him more open to playstyle criticism than perhaps any other class. Especially since Valve has removed the ability to inspect other players' upgrades. As I said earlier, it's commonly assumed that the Engineer will maximize dispenser range immediately to support his team, although in a pinch you can get away with just two ticks for the first wave. Teammates will also usually demand that you share your dispenser, which is important. Some groups will even ask you to build your dispenser in the exact spot requested by the Heavy or some other class. Such particularity is usually reserved for the dispenser only. Criticism of sentry or teleporter placement is probably less common, with some particular exceptions, like when the bomb gets past the front line. It's often expected that the engineer will essentially babysit the bomb if it gets past the front. This protects the team in case a robot sneaks by unnoticed and picks up the bomb. It's a decent strategy overall, since the average MVM team suffers from tunnel vision and won't notice a robot behind them until it's too late. The sentry's automatic targeting system and its invulnerability to knockback make it a good candidate for standing guard and picking up stragglers in most situations. The engineer isn't always the best suited for this job, especially if there are a lot of spies or sentry busters on the map, so just be sure to verbally confirm that someone else will do this job when you can't. If you are guarding the bomb, take stock of the situation. If only a few robots are getting through and there are no sentry busters, your sentry probably doesn't need constant attention. Situations like this are a good opportunity to go back to the front and help out your team as a battle engineer. The scoreboard doesn't have any particular bias either for or against the engineer in MVM. This doesn't mean that an engineer at the top of the scoreboard is the most valuable player on his team though. Since an NG's building placement has such a fundamental effect on the shape of the battlefield, Undermining one's teammates is just as effective a way to top score as is actually playing the objective. It's not hard. Put your teleporters in a crappy spot, hog your dispenser up on a perch where no one but the sniper can reach it, 
completely ignore the bomb and farm easy points off of weak bat scout support squads. Yeah, you'll get the highest score, but you'll be failing your team nonetheless, and probably losing the wave. The engineer doesn't need to babysit his teammates like a medic, but just a little bit of thoughtfulness when it comes to building placement goes a long way. The sign of a good engineer in Man vs. Machine is not his place on the scoreboard, it's the subtle way that everything just runs a bit more smoothly when he's there. This has been Underscore Gaming's Man vs. Machine tutorial series, The Engineer, with Mr. Underscore. Yes, I do have an actual engineering license now, and if I didn't procrastinate too much in getting this video out, it should be the one that finally pushes this channel past 1,000 subscribers, so yay! Thanks to all of you for the fake internet points. This engineering analysis did not undergo peer review, so don't forget to check the video description and or pinned comment for errata. Cheers!